Hello everyone, please take a seat. Welcome to this introductory course on Linux. Uh, we are the alternative. We organize this series of events every year and um, every semester actually. And uh, please, uh, everybody get a, one of these feedback sheets. They provide very valuable feedback to us so we can improve these courses even further. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy I can announce Simon for this course. Um, he's a computer science student, and uh, he told me he's been a Linux user since he was 12. And uh, yeah, let's uh, give it up for Simon. Thank you, Sandro. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone. Thank you for coming in such huge numbers. Uh, I will introduce you to Linux over the next 90 minutes. Um, but first, I will say something uh, about us, the alternative. In case you have been to the previous um, course about free software, you already know who we are, but I will go over the short facts anyway. Um, we are a student organization who promotes uh, a more, a more sustainable digital lifestyle. We do this primarily through these promotion events for Linux. Um, you can check our website uh, at thealternative.ch. Um, somewhere around here there should be flyers. Did we bring them? No. Um, and yes, we are open to new members all through the year. So then, what is this going to be about? Um, of course, what is Linux? Who knows what's Linux? Oh, okay. So I can go home now? No? Okay. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about Linux, maybe fill some gaps in your knowledge. Um, then I will go quite deep into the reasons why to switch to Linux. I will talk a little bit about distribu distributions, about the main draw of Linux, package managers, um, a little bit about installing Linux, but that will be mainly the topic of the install events. And at the end of the presentation, I will have a few words of what to do next. So, you had a long day, I presume, a little bit tired, uh, so we will have a little exercise uh, to reactivate your brains and uh, get you engaged. Uh, would you please all stand up? Thank you. Um, so, how this is going to work is... Um, I will show you an application of Linux, and if you already used it, you're allowed to sit down. <laughs> so, uh, who knows what this is? This is a cow milker. This cow milker runs Linux. So, nobody in agriculture, cow milking? No. <laughs> um, next up, crockpot. Um, that's a stew-making device, simply put. Uh, wireless connected, it's an IoT device, runs Linux inside. Um, since we're at ETH, who has one of these calculators? Ah, there we go. <laughs> so it's run Linux too. Um, who runs Android? Linux kernel 2 in there. I thought that would get most of you. Uh, then more Swiss thing, <laughs> ticket vending machines, all of those run Linux. Maybe that explains why the UI sometimes isn't that intuitive. <laughs> and last but not least, those guys, those run on Linux uh, more or less exclusively. So uh, as you see, Linux is uh, in our most of our daily lives. Uh, most of you 
probably have a router at home, those home routers. Many of them run Linux, some run some other sort of free software. A tiny fraction of them has a proprietary firmware, but most of those run Linux. All uh, Chromecasts run Linux, all Fire TVs run Linux at the base, Android TVs, Linux too. So uh, you already are Linux users, all of you. Um, so this shouldn't be too scary jumping in now. Um, and they prepared a little metaphor to make it a little bit easier to wrap your heads around this whole Linux thing and what it is and why it's different. Um, if we imagine now, for just a moment, that computers were cars, uh, your average par parking lot would look a lot like this. Um, the Microsoft cars, yeah, they sort of work. They are not the most modern, not the most flashy, but they work. And um, then there are the Mac cars. They are really flashy. They are f maybe f a little bit faster. And um, yeah, there's not, much, there's not much choice. But what do we have with our car ecosystem? We have a lot of choice because we have a lot of different use cases. We have a lot of different expectations from a car. and. So why is our computing life so different to our car driving life? Um, I want to extend this analogy a little bit further. Um, if, you, if you imagine this car, this car has paint on it. It has windows, just like windows. Um, that's equivalent to the graphical user interface. Then a car, of course, has a frame. Each operating system has a frame, stuff that runs beneath the GUI, uh, that makes the whole thing work, services, and um, uh, the, for example, the package manager, the display server, and so on. And then, of course, what drives the car, what powers the car, is the engine. So. We have this too in cars. There are a few manufacturers of engines and a lot of car brands. And a lot of car brands run uh, motors from other car brands inside them. And with Linux, it works sort of the same because Linux has uh, a very layered architecture, as you can see. Um, at the base level, we have the hardware that is more or less managed by the kernel. And on top of this kernel, you can run an arbitrary set of software because the kernel uh, makes it easy for the software to talk to the hardware. It takes, keyboard, it, it, it takes uh, keyboard input, it displays images on, on the screen, it sends and receives network packages, etc. And above, this, um, this kernel layer, there is usually in Linux the, a shell environment, um, or what's called a terminal. Next layer up, we have a display server. And on top of that, there is a very thin layer of paint, uh, just, with the car, just like with a car, uh, what's the GUI. And all of those layers are more or less uh, interchangeable according to your own tastes. Um, now, the tricky thing about um, cars is, uh, with cars, you're allowed to tinker, more or less. You can do all sorts of things to your car. Um, with, modern op with modern operating systems, not so much. They don't allow you to tinker. If you don't like the font, yeah, you can change the font. If you don't like the design, uh, it's getting iffy. Um, but with Linux, of course, you're allowed to tinker with everything. Um, also, the, the engine is slightly less complex than the Linux kernel. Uh, the Linux kernel at the moment has about 20 million lines of code. And yeah, a rough average time per line of code is about 10 minutes of work time that is spent distributed over all the code lines, so uh, 
if you run the math in your head, it's a massive project. Um, next up, a little bit, just a little bit about licensing. Um, you already heard that at the first talk, a lot about licensing. Um, the Linux kernel is all GPL version 2. That means um, it through and through free software. Um, you are allowed to copy it, change it, redistribute it, and so on. Um, then, of course, uh, there are binary blobs in the kernel that are proprietary, for example, to Intel or NVIDIA. But uh, that doesn't really matter because it works with the kernel. Of course, there are purists that say, yeah, this is not really Linux. No, we don't do that. But that's politics. No politics today. <laughs> um, so the open license thing, thing always throws up the question, who made Linux? Who does this? And why? So who knows this guy? Who is this? Tell me. Yes, that's Linus Torvalds. Uh, did he create Linux uh, about 24, 23 years ago now? Uh, just last, last week, yes. Last week was uh, uh, the birthday of Linux. Um, did he create it? Yes, maybe initially. But the idea really, he just needed, he just needed an operating system, so he wrote one. Because I can, he, he, he wrote compilers, he wrote uh, text editors, why not an operating system? Mm, this guy, anyone? Oh, okay, not so much. Um, that's Richard Stallman. He is the creator of the GPL license. He had more or less the free software idea cast into a contract. Did he create Linux? Not so much. He, he actually claims I never installed GNU slash Linux. So did he create that? Or was it uh, all the programmers that work on, on the internal plumbing of, of the whole middle layer between the kernel and, and the GUI stuff? Like those two guys, the maintainers that maintain the code in the kernel, or is it uh, the people with the big money that uh, throw a whole lot of money behind uh, certain distributions? Are it those guys who made Linux? Or those guys? The um, organizations that commercially sell Linux? Did they create Linux? Or more the independent funding gathering organizations, the foundations, did they create Linux? It's, it's really complicated. And that's the beautiful thing about Linux. Because it's only possible if we all work together. And uh, it's really, really a community effort. And I'd have the bold claim that we today here right now create Linux. Because Linux is not only about, not only about open, so open source. It's not only about the code. It's not only about philosophy. It's about the community that creates a philosophy, that creates code, that shares code, that goes on in maybe not so uncontroversial directions, in more uh, directions that everybody agrees on. And that's why I say we today here create Linux. Um, so enough of the um, enthusiastic blabbering and more into the reasoning. Why should you switch to Linux? What, what, what makes it compelling to switch? Uh, I came up with this little diagram. It's a little bit bold, I'd say. But um, I will uh, have a word about all those points. So a little bit more about the, some, a little less about others. Um, so I say Linux is powerful. Why is it powerful? Um, it puts this first. It gives you a very, very close interface uh, with very, very little distraction, with uh, a high amount of precision, no fiddling with the mouse. You can write in just a few lines uh, what 
would take you hours to do with a GUI. Um, the, com the, the command line can do everything you want, from image processing uh, to developer tools like Git, web browsers, uh, and of course the whole uh, configuration ma and management can be taken down to the console. Uh, we will have a course about this. Uh, after the install event, uh, there will be uh, the power of Linux and the Linux toolkit, and there you can learn a whole lot more about uh, the command line interface. And then, of course, we have graphical applications. People always say, ah, Linux doesn't have powerful this, powerful that, um, but that's actually not true anymore. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, graphical applications for everything. Uh, starts with uh, with office suits, uh, web browsers, developer tools, even computer aided design. I once built a small um, uh, guitar amplifier with Eagle. Didn't have to pay a buck for a layouting program. Awesome. Then, uh, of course, creative suits, communication tools, email, um, media players, uh, password managers, identity managers, basically everything you want. You just have to find it and maybe a little bit of uh, learning a new paradigm, possibly, but you can do everything. So, um, there's a lot of discussion if t people say Linux is more secure. Um, there, is not a definite, uh, there, there is not a definite answer to this question, is Linux really secure? But I'm going to talk about the points that really, really speak for it. Um, of course, it's open source. Everyone can have a look at it. Everyone can audit the code. Everyone can compile it for themselves and uh, validate that it does what it says and that it only does what it says. Um, then another big advantage is Linux is diverse. Linux is distributed and most of the projects are independent from each other. And this takes away a central pressure point for either criminal organizations or state actors. Um, and this is actually really important. If a government says no encryption in our country, open source doesn't care because the project can just move or the source code can be, or the source code can be forked and the project can be continued outside of this regulation. Um, then updates. Uh, Linux has more or less daily security updates that are facilitated through a package manager that can uniformly keep your system up to date. Uh, Windows or let's say Microsoft just dropped their last patch Tuesday last month. They had about three or four th zero day vulnerabilities pending. This means these are dangerous exploits that are uh, in the wild, hacker use, hackers using them to attack systems, and Microsoft said, no patch day this month, so you have two months of unpatched zero-day vulnerab zero vulnerabilities. Won't happen in Linux. Of course, there is a lot of, of uh, press about uh, vulnerabilities in Linux. You might know the Heartbleed vulnerability from 2012. 12, if I remember correctly, and just recently the Dirty Cow vulnerability made a huge lot of press, but was more or less patched in the time window of two days. And that's what, it, what makes it really, really um, responsive and more secure. Then, of course, there's a low amount of malware. Most hackers are smart people and they won't shoot them in their own foot. Um, and Linux has grown up with the concept of separating processes, users, and other concerns from each other. And that is something that Microsoft just took up just recently, um, about 10 years ago, uh, 12 years ago, as I was 12, I managed to log in into, my, into the Windows 95 box as my mother, as a 12-year-old. And that wouldn't have been possible if the 
the machine ran Linux. And then, of course, uh, we were just reminded that uh, we are constantly watched with the new Vault 7 leaks. And privacy and encryption is not just built into the software, it's built into the community, into the idea of Linux. If you have a Microsoft box, you have to have a professional license so you even get the Microsoft BitLocker. Um, and Linux just comes with it. If you, if you want, during the installation process, you just tick a box and your drive is encrypted. We already hit on this a little bit. Linux is highly customizable and very versatile. Um, and the next few, few slides will just illustrate this. So, who thought that this was a good design decision? Who likes it? This is, this is user-friendly. Does it make you work faster? Be honest. I know it's a loaded question. <laughs> um, who doesn't find this confusing? Microsoft privacy settings? And this, this is stupidly annoying, isn't it? So if you just could change it, well, Linux allows you this, to change everything, not only the paint on top of it. You can choose between multiple different uh, computing paradigms. How do you want to work with your machine? Do you want to use the terminal? Do you prefer a graphical user interface? Do you want to have a more traditional desktop with a start menu and maybe desktop icons and widgets? And, uh, or do you want to break history and create something completely new and have, a, uh, have an operating system that mainly works by searching for stuff? Uh, or do you need something that doesn't need a whole lot of RAM and CPU power and uh, maybe there is no dedicated graphics card in your laptop? You can do this. You don't need to upgrade your system every two years because, because uh, some designer decides that there, needs, there have to be more shadows and more window decoration, whatever. And finally, you're not, you're not constricted to the defaults. On the one side, you have a default installation of XFC. On the other side, someone has put in quite a lot of effort to make it look and feel like he wants and how he, he uses his laptop or his, his desktop. Another example, this is OpenSUSE with KDE, unrecognizable. Oh, of course, it takes a lot of effort and time, but you can do it. You can just do it for fun or you can do it because it, it helps you work. And then, of course, Linux is versatile. Linux scales very, very well. Linux can run on a mini computer like the Raspberry Pi Zero that you can see on the top. Or Linux can run on a supercomputer, the largest ones in the world, with uh, uh, about 20 million cores and 15 terabytes of RAM. And it's the same tools, it's the same kernel. Uh, if, you can, if you can work on a laptop, if you can work on a Raspberry Pi, you can work on this supercomputer. If you familiar with Linux. And that's actually the very, very amazing thing. You don't, you don't learn Linux and then after two years you have to learn Linux again. And after another two years uh, you don't find anything anymore in your configuration menu and feel stupid like I do when I want to change uh, disk partitions in Windows 10. I, I simply wasn't able to as I tried the first time. And if you, if you change now, you, can, uh, you won't need to change for the next 10 years if you want to. Then Linux is also often talked about in the light of cost and in the light of support. Uh, in the light of cost, maybe a little bit more favorably than in the light of support. Support and cost is often related. 
Um, Linux has a huge advantage in that it is free of cost. Um, and it has a low technical debt. This means if you invest into your computing platform, into a learning curve, into adapting into your, into your operating system, this creates some kind of lock-in mechanism. But Linux is so diverse and Linux runs on all kinds of hardware, you can bring Linux to your hardware. You don't have to bring your skills to a platform. You can port your platform from the tiniest devices to the biggest devices. And that really reduces your personal cost, your technical debt that you owe to your, to your tools. Um, then there is, of course, commercial support available. As we saw before, there are companies that sell Linux commercially. Um, but they can do this at a much lower cost than, than a proprietary developer um, because a lot of the work is not done by them. A lot of the work is done by the community. Then Linux is also very cost efficient in terms of hardware. It doesn't eat, a lot, eat up a lot of resources and it's able to run on very old hardware. Uh, on the bottom you see a ThinkPad X200S. That's a computer that is almost 10 years old. Um, and if you stick an SSD in there and maybe two additional gigs of RAM, you get yourself a very nice laptop that uh, is very sturdy, has a lot of battery life. And if you get it off of eBay, maybe 100 bucks, maybe 200 bucks, you, you get the SSD into RAM. You, 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 you uh, pay 400 bucks and you're good. You're good to go. Uh, same thing with the uh, Infinity One at the top. That's a um, low-cost laptop. It goes over the counter for about 350 bucks. And then, of course, because it is cost-efficient, you can find Linux in all sorts of places. Um, education facilities, government. I don't know how you feel about government spending your tax your tax money on proprietary Microsoft licenses when they could get the whole lot for free. Yeah, the list is quite extensive. In the past, uh, the whole cloud thing blew up because uh, yeah, you don't have to pay for each license. You just spin them up, spin them down. doesn't cost you anything. Um, then support. Who had this kind of error message? Who knows this? Critical error occurred. Please contact your system administrator. Yeah, great. And now, I personally don't have a system administrator at home. I am the system administrator myself, but don't tell them. <laughs> um, and if you then do contact someone, they want, they want to charge you 20 bucks to chat to people, not to talk to people, not someone who comes, comes by and has a look at your problem, to chat to people. Linux does this. Oh, you want to run this software? Hmm, it appears you don't have it installed. Maybe try doing this. Same thing with, uh, with when something crashes. You always get a lot of meaningful error messages out of your, your Linux. Um, installation and next thing you do, because you get so much valuable information, you can do this. You can go to a forum, to a mailing list, to a wiki maybe, or uh, an IRC ch channel for example, and you can chat to people. But it's free to chat to people and most of the people that are there, they are motivated, they are interested uh, because they want to help their fellow Linux uh, brothers and sisters. And I organized uh, these support uh, opportunities in, in, in multiple um, different categories. Most distributions run their own forums, uh, mailing lists, of course. Bug trackers are not really newbie friendly, but Valuable, valuable information can be found there too. Uh, then most distributions run a wiki and some run IRC channels. And of course, if you have projects, a lot of projects uh, have 
some of the above, but most of them have um, are developed on GitHub, and the GitHub issue tracker is also uh, a source of information. And of course, there is community-driven stuff like blogs uh, and Reddit. Reddit is actually quite cool for for getting Linux support. Then there's uh, the Stack, Stack Exchange group that has a lot of Linux centered uh, exchange platforms, user groups like us. You, we have uh, a Stammtisch every two weeks. You can come by and ask us all sorts of questions. And uh, a recent addition, Fandom and, and Wikia, um, if somebody knows about this. And if you just have a general interest questions, there is always uh, the Arch and Ubuntu Wiki. Linuxquestions.org. Those are all places where you will be very, very welcome, and you will find this sort of documentation, very detailed instructions, um, things that go that can go wrong, things that um, might be useful to provide if you are looking for support, and if you then actually post a question, you usually get a lot of feedback and it will come quite quickly. This is 10 minutes later. The guy has some issue with his sound system and he decided to post on the Arch Wiki and he got the response 10 minutes after. Uh, last time I wanted to contact Microsoft for support, I uh, spent one and a half hours in about three different phone trees. Wasn't a lot of fun. So then, uh, now we are more or less halfway through. Um, would you want to have a break for 10 minutes? No? Okay. Then let's rip right through. Um, you saw the term user respecting. I re avoided user friendly because user friendliness is very, very subjective. Um, no, thank you, Windows 10. I don't want to upgrade. I really don't. Um, what I mean by user respecting is the software actually assumes that you're a capable human being and it doesn't ask you all the time about, do you really want to do this? Are you sure you want to do that? Maybe you should do this and this. Um, none of that. None of, of those strange, if you download this, then we could also in install this, and at the end of the day you have three different search toolbars and two different uh, antivirus setups, and uh, at the end you catch some kind of malware. None of that, because we have uh, centralized and um, very closely vetted software repositories that are directly connected into your, into your system and all the stuff in there is signed with uh, digital keys. You can't forge that stuff. And you just, you just get it by one click and uh, you have none of that. And yeah, you don't have stupid privacy settings like this because they, they don't even try to. Uh, to, to collect all this information, what, what would they do with it? Because there is no commercial interest in, in spying on you. Um, then those sorts of things, forcing the user into doing something like upgrading to a new operating system, downloading 15 gigabytes of, of, of content to install a new operating system. Imagine this goes over your mobile data connection by accident. Horrible. Uh, then, next thing, licensing. If if I install my if I if I redo my laptop, do I have to new, do I have a new license? Can I can I run two installations for two different purposes? Mac OS X says no, you can't. Linux says if you want to have thirty different of, on, on on one machine, yeah, I don't care. You can you can just do with it what you want and. If uh, if you if you have such a key and you lose it, what do you do then? Mm. With Linux, you just you just have you just don't have to mess with things like this. So, I talked about a lot of good things. 
how to get them. Uh, Linux is usually, usually packaged into distributions. Um, you can think of a content curator. They collect and applications that they think are, are doing things right, and they package them into a nice, uh, into a nice experience that you can download and install onto your uh, machine. But there, each distribution usually comes with a package manager, as I already mentioned. They have their own software repositories where you download software from. But the really core of a distribution is their philosophy. Each distribution has their own idea how computing should work. Debian focuses on stability because they, they really value stable software that can run for years without reboot on servers. Um, they prefer not breaking stuff over, over the newest and shiniest. And then there is, for example, Fedora that risks breaking some stuff. On the other hand, you get the newest and the flashiest. Then there is Ubuntu. Ubuntu focuses on, on usability, uh, on user friendliness, um, on a lot are on, on, on uh, friendliness towards newer users. And each, each and every distribution chooses its own core values. And this, of course, leads to a lot of this. Everyone in here, I guess, has his own little preferences about computing. And if you, if you sum that up into, into a bigger picture, um, you get a lot, of, a lot of different flavors of Linux. Um, on, the, on this side, you can see the main, uh, the main distributions that uh, have sprung up over the years, and on this side, you have just a tiny, tiny little fraction. Uh, the upper, like third, um, and this is this is all. These are all distributions based on Debian, um, and all those, all those, are derived from Debian, and Debian provided the, the groundwork and. They took that groundwork and gave it their gave it their own idea, implanted it their their own idea. Ubuntu is based on Debian, but if you install a Debian, you will feel like it's five it's five years old. It's truly five years old. If you install if you install an Ubuntu, you don't get that feeling. Um, and this um, this really shows. How, how open source is truly enabling to everyone. Because everyone can, if they are technically a little bit capable, um, bring their own ideas into, into uh, maybe a distribution, maybe a single software project. So then a few more words about the package manager. What, what, do, you, uh, what do I have to imagine if I say package manager. So there are collections of software curated by distributions. Um, they're, in, in, they're stored on the internet in what's called a repository. And the package manager is basically an interface that allows you to search and find applications in there, download them, install them, configure them automatically with a, with a, with a default setting. And at the end, if you don't use it anymore, remove it with and remove all of it. Um, everything that was installed with this application is gone afterwards. You uninstall it, unless some other program uses a part of, of the installed application. And I can just show you this now. Um, this here is, uh, um, yeah, As, whoops. Go over there, yes please, like this. This here is uh, the software center of Fedora, um, and it's pretty much point and click. Um, if you if you want to install new software, you click one of those items, and you're done. It does it all for you. And if I manage to hit 
this button, I can show you how mm, updates work. Updates work basically like clicking this button. You don't have to update your Flash, your Java, your Chrome, your Firefox and your Microsoft Office suite independently. You just hit one button, everything is done. You can even say, I don't want to hit this button. Just do it. And that makes the whole Linux thing a lot more um, manageable because you don't, you don't have to think about uh, where you get your software from and how you get it and how you get rid of it. it, it it's, just, it's just done by the package manager and this saves you so much work. And of course there are, you're not limited to the package manager. If you want to, you can go to whatever software project and download their, their source code and compile it from source. Most, um, most distributions, but no, most projects offer packages for the different distributions outside those package rep repositories. Hell, there is even emulation software that can run a part of uh, Windows software. Not all of it, but some of it. Um, that I already showed. Um, then different ideas have different ideas of stability. Um, Ubuntu, for example, they ship a long-term supported version every two years. Between those uh, major releases, there are smaller releases. Um, and you can pretty much choose if you want to hop from long-term support to long-term long -term support uh, after two years. You can have the whole four years of the long-term support and then upgrade to the next, more or less skipping every second. Or you can update every half year to a new, um, to a new uh, operating system version. And this gives you a lot of freedom and stability. Another example is the OpenSUSE update cycle, they release every year and uh, every three years they um, have a long-term supported version that is supported for three other years. How many, how many operating system releases were in the last 10 years by Microsoft? About th three and every, every single one of them Ma broke major things and they completely overhauled their complete experience and most a lot of people really really don't like this and you can avoid this and if if and if if a change occurs that you don't like there is there are always people that feel the same and it takes it takes maybe a year and then there is another option available for you because you're not the only one. So then how to install Linux after you chose a distribution? It's pretty much download, install, download, install, profit. In most cases. There are, there are some uh, smaller caveats, but um, those will be covered at the installation event. One really, really amazing thing is Linux won't break your already existing OS. You can run Linux alongside your Mac OS, your Windows, uh, FreeBSD, whatever you like, um, because there is a thing called dual booting or multi-booting. Um, as you can see here, it says, take, a sp take space away from Windows and use it for Linux but Windows will keep, will keep working. And the really amazing thing is if your li Windows installation breaks, your Linux installation still works and the other way around because they A, don't run uh, at the same time so you don't get any performance loss and they are completely independent. Um, independent doesn't mean that you can't access your files on your other um, operating systems, you can just as easily work on the data you generated on Windows with Linux um, 
as you can with Windows, uh, it's basically just like opening a thumb drive. So, what next? I hope uh, I inspired you to take part uh, on our installation day, so we will happily support you in uh, your endeavors to install Linux. Um, so, um, that's where to go next. Um, install events next week, uh, the dates can be uh, accessed on our website on the calendar. Um, the following week is Linux Toolkit. Uh, if you don't have, if you haven't had enough of this ugly mug, you can see me uh, on Linux Toolkit again, um, where we will talk a little bit about the command line, how to use it, um, really, really easing you in into the whole uh, scary text-based stuff. If you if you really caught on to using the console, there's Power of Linux and the, Bur the Bash workshops. Bash workshop uh, focuses on automation and scripting to basically make your life easier. Uh, we this year have new a Linux Q&A where, where you can come by and ask questions. And then at the end of, of these very interesting queue of talks, there will be a session on GPG. GPG is a privacy tool that allows you to encrypt email and other messages. Um, very interesting in the recent light of uh, the multitude of uh, leaks that have occurred. And at the very last, the closing session is about how to distribute and package uh, your own free software, your scientific applications. So now uh, I'm open to questions. Ask me anything. No one? Did I talk so much that your heads explode? <laughs> <laughs> okay, then thank you for coming. Uh, check out our website. Please fill out the feedback forms. Uh, we will very much appreciate it. And then, yeah, see you at the Stammtisch. Uh, we generally have an informal get together. Uh, we enjoy some drinks, talk nerdy stuff about uh, Linux and free software and other stuff. And Feel free to bring your laptop, uh, we offer help and conversation. Right, thanks everyone. Um, we have some demonstration laptops uh, prepared if you wanna come and uh, try out some of these Linux distributions and uh, have a play with it and also talk to us if you like. Yeah, thanks for coming. <laughs>